Uh, hello, um, I am uh, Noah Thorpe, uh, founder of Upside, and um, uh, my talk today is on decrypting the path to thriving, resilient futures powered by RWAs. So um, this, is, this is a bit more of a think piece um, that's based on my experience over the last uh, decade in the industry. And um, I know you've uh, absorbed a lot of technical materials, and um, this talk is a little bit more about the why, why are we building this? So I wanna talk a bit today about um, thriving and resilient futures and how to build them. And with this, uh, with this concept, there are, there are a few different pieces. Um, the first part is um, how can we define what a positive future actually is? Second part is um, how uh, blockchain native investors actually play a very critical role in this and how the values uh, that are in Bitcoin and Ethereum um, can be extended to connect with RWA and STO frameworks. It's really um, a deep question about what comes next, um, and so that's what we're gonna explore. So um, a little bit of more uh, context on uh, how I came to ask this question with you today. Um, so uh, Upside uh, is a company that I founded. Um, our purpose is to empower blockchain native investing in a resilient and thriving future. And um, currently we're known for our tokenization operating system for RWAs, security tokens, and utility tokens. Um, our platform enables sophisticated vestings and lockups, transfer restrictions for security tokens for compliance. Um, we work with Ethereum, Avalanche, uh, Polygon, and also Solana. Um, we're working on a uh, grant with the Solana Foundation right now for extending their security token uh, framework. Uh, and uh, we originally were incubated as a infrastructure company for uh, Republic Crypto. And in partnership uh, with Republic Crypto as the software provider, we launched uh, over a market cap of two billion worth of tokens that are held by uh, over three million uh, blockchain addresses. And uh, as I mentioned, we've done everything or worked on uh, tokenized funds, stocks, bonds, real estate, utility tokens, gaming, and L1 crypto. So we have quite a broad experience in the space. Um, I personally got involved in this space um, uh, way back in 2015, uh, working on uh, launching, uh, trying to build crypto equity on colored coins for Bitcoin and we launched a DAO in December of 2015 on colored coins and then uh, evolved into the Ethereum space. So I've really been quite uh, dedicated and loyal to the space for quite a long time. And so a lot of the, uh, a lot of the ethos of the space is very, is, uh, very heartfelt for me. Um, before that, I was uh, VP of engineering at NASDAQ Private Market, um, and that was a, um, a private market uh, system that was um, sort of built out of a shares post system for doing pre-IPO stocks, so I also have the private market background. And um, so with that, I'm giving you enough, a bunch of context so that you know that um, what I'm sharing philosophically is based on this, this foundation. And just to give an example of the kind of things we worked on, uh, this is a historical screenshot from quite a while ago, but uh, uh, this is an example of democratizing access to startup stock, this is the, um, Actually, this ties so many of the speakers together here. This is the uh, um, uh, Republic Note token uh, that uh, was a contributor to the original white paper, and then we upside launched the software portion of this. It integrates with INX, and is traded on INX, and uh, it also integrates with a transfer agent named Brassica. Um, and uh, this really represents you know, quite a lot of work in the industry. The, the white paper for this was in 2017, so <laughs> it took quite a long time to launch. Um, and um, I, I think it's quite a triumph in the space. And just disclaimers, this is historical screenshot, this is not investment advice, do your research. Um, let's see, yes, so one of the unique perspectives that Upside has as a, as a company, and um, I think I would like to see as being more prevalent in the space, uh, is um, that uh, we, uh, we believe in um, in this uh, blockchain native orientation. Hmm. I've lost my screen here. Someone can help me with that. Um, so we believe in this uh, blockchain native uh, orientation. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry, can, uh, can you help here? The screen's not, it's just not working. This isn't working. Apologies, just a little technical difficulty. Uh, There's no screen. Uh, check the screen. Oh, I can't read that. 
I don't know what it is. I can't read it. <laughs> um, so, okay, I'm going to do the uh, faux pas of reading up here. Um, so, um, Upside's blockchain native orientation is that um, whereas most people in this space are thinking about uh, how to get, say, crypto assets to the real world, which was sort of the original value proposition in cryptos, and this is what has birthed a lot of uh, Bitcoin ETFs and uh, uh, these, these sorts of uh, uh, products. Um, and uh, some people are also trying to do TradFi to, to TradFi, or traditional finance to traditional finance on a blockchain. Um, that's fine, but um, what I'm most interested in is uh, this blockchain native orientation, which is how to get um, real world assets into the hands of blockchain native investors. And blockchain native investors have a different perspective than uh, traditional retail investors. So um, uh, the reason why this is really important right now is that there are now 600 million people that uh, are holding uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, and are, can be considered blockchain native investors, and they're controlling um, two trillion dollars worth of assets. So this is actually a new investor class, and um, so I, I think the perspective shift is that I think um, there's been a question of like, oh, how do we get m more retail investors to participate in crypto? And I, I don't think that's actually the moment that we're in. I think this is a, a new moment. And uh, historically, it's actually blockchain native investors who have really driven adoption. So the most uh, prevalent uh, real world asset is um, uh, our stable coins. And stable coin ad adoption uh, was originally created as the, the main trading pair between Bitcoin and um, USDT. And it's, it's still the most actively traded trading pair. And it originally started out as just being something that blockchain uh, native folks wanted. And then over time, it's become very useful for blockchain agnostic people around the world for payments, remittances, programmable money, and as this foundational layer for a lot of other technologies. And I think we're in this, uh, this stage now where we're seeing a diversification of the on-chain portfolio. Um, so that includes now T-bills uh, with the Franklin Templeton projects and, uh, and others. And then we're moving more into these real estate tokenization, stock tokenization, uh, watches, all sorts of physical assets. But uh, my, my argument here, which is uh, borrowed from uh, Alliance, is that, uh, that actually it's the, it's the on-chain investors, the ones that have already converted, that are driving this adoption. Now, there's a lot of predictions about how, uh, how large this, this adoption could be. This is, uh, I would say, somewhere in the, in the middle range uh, where they're predicting $10 trillion in RWA diversification by 2030. And uh, my contention is that it actually is the 600 million uh, investors who are already on chain that are going to be the, the front end of moving, these, moving this adoption forward. And there's a reason for that. If you take the perspective of just being a blockchain native investor and looking at your portfolio there, your portfolio has a huge gap um, between stable coins and tokenized treasury with a 5% yield all the way up to Bitcoin. There's this huge portfolio gap between 7% and you know 30% annual return. And that represents a huge amount of real world assets, you know, over $500 trillion worth of real world assets that haven't been tokenized. Um, but there's, there's a reason why this gap hasn't been filled yet. And um, part of that has to do with, uh, with what blockchain native investors' preferences actually are. So this, this is where it gets a little bit more philosophical. So um, my view is that there is a underlying blockchain native ethos um, and that this technology is more than just a technology it actually has a direction to it. So if you look at the progression of the technologies that rolled out and have brought us to this RWA conversation, the first technology was really about individual sovereignty or privacy. So this is encryption itself, so private key encryption. Then next after that, um, we have uh, individual empowerment around finances, which is, which is Bitcoin, um, uh, which is a very sort of self-sovereign idea. Uh, and then we got into trustless, resilient infrastructure um, with, uh, with blockchain consensus mechanisms, different voting mechanisms. How can we build really resilient systems that are public infrastructure? 
um, and make it self-funding. So uh, Ethereum is, is a great example of that. Um, and it, its purpose was to empower better global coordination through uh, DAOs and uh, other, other governance techniques. So DAO frameworks, quadratic voting, et cetera. And then um, now we're kind of to this democratization of investment access being built on top of these uh, previous uh, innovations. So RWAs, STOs, fractionalization. And, um, and then uh, the next kind of phase, which hasn't, I haven't heard anyone in this conference mention it yet, is empowering communities with shared values from network to physical space. And this is the, the network state um, concept, which is uh, being um, sort of pioneered by Balaji uh, Srinivasan. So this is, a very, this is a very different arc of progress than simply, say, um, taking traditional finance and making it faster and, um, and more efficient. There's actually a, a, an underlying ethos. So, um, sounds a bit utopian. Um, and uh, in fact, it is a bit utopian because uh, there have been some really crazy challenges that have happened in this ecosystem. I, I refer to them as the, the insects of Eden, which, um, so we have this utopian garden that we're building that's resilient and thriving, but we also have things like, uh, like FTX that happened, um, which, was, which is an incredible betrayal of the, of the values of this community. And uh, yeah, it's, it's just really disturbing how, how this played out. And the thing that makes this even more um, disturbing was that there also was a, fa a failure of the existing regulatory frameworks. And, and um, I don't know if any of you have looked at the, um, uh, at the licensure for FTX, but FTX actually was regulated. They had uh, CFTC licenses. They had, um, they had uh, um, uh, uh, digital payment services licenses, et cetera. There's a huge like a page of these licenses. So they were regulated. Um, but uh, they were able to, con to uh, perpetrate a very vanilla level f you know, fraud that would be, you know, uh, is, is obviously illegal going back to the, um, the US acts uh, that, that occurred after the Great Depression. So this was nothing new on that front. But, um, but it was done under the guise of uh, this, uh, this Web3 ethos. So it was, uh, it was in fact, centralized. Um, and uh, it, it really underlined why these trustless systems are actually necessary. And um, you know, many there were many um, many changes that people made after after that failure in terms, you know, proof of reserves, things like that. Um, but I think that what this you know this points the way to is uh, answering the question of how our communities, who actually have a, this very strong ethos, are able to determine which projects are leading towards this positive future and which ones are scams. And this has been a major problem. So. Uh, one, one thing about insects is that you know insects are very, <laughs> very necessary for uh, for evolution. They're a part of the ecosystem, and I think what we should do is look at these failures as being uh, sort of uh, insects and parasites. We need to figure out how to be resilient to and not sort of see them as the the total of the ecosystem. So uh, decrypting the path to the thriving, resilient futures. So how how do we find positive futures to invest in? Um, and uh, I, I think this is actually a surprisingly hard question. It seems very simple. There's a lot of platitudes that we can say. But um, you know, when we really get into it, if, if I'm to say that, hey, we want to we wanna only invest in things that are going to lead to a positive future, there, it, it brings up a lot of cynicism, actually. And there's different kinds of cynicism about it. And, um, but at the same time, we live in this era of exponentially powerful technology. And we have a lot of existential threats. So I think it's also a very important question to, to be thinking about. So just to map out, just to say these out loud, some of the, <laughs> some of the blocks to thinking about a, uh, a positive future. Um, I think there's a lot of hopelessness right now. For example, I, I had a conversation, I've been hosting conversations about building positive futures. And some of the questions that might come up is uh, I've had activists say to me, like, a positive future for who? There's a, a sense they may get left out. Or um, a positive, you know, positive futures are naive or delusional. This is a very like high IQ answer. <laughs> um, or the money skeptic might even say, well, maybe money itself can't even create a positive future. Or there might be existential doubt, like their positive futures may not exist, or 
um, they're, they're unachievable. And then finally, there might be sort of some doubt about humanity's capacity you know, on its own to overcome some of the, the struggles that we've had that may have lasted for thousands of years, and um, that, uh, that maybe humans are, are uh, not capable of building these, these truly positive futures. So these are the things that are in the way. Um, and uh, so I, I think it's actually kind of important that, to note that I, I think actually most of these things are, are emotional in nature, <laughs> um, that, that they're kind of keeping us, they're in the way of us actually thinking about what, uh, what, could, be, uh, what could be a positive future. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I, I will just uh, encourage everyone to, uh, you know, take, take a breath and, and think like, Hey, it's seven years from now, and there's been a, a huge breakthrough. And what does that actually feel like? It feels really good to think that we've discovered something new that's changed our perspective on these intractable problems. And maybe from that feeling that there could be a positive future to bring that back into the present and uh, use that to help us imagine how to get there. So there's two things that I feel pretty clearly, like in terms of anchoring what a positive future is. Uh, and these two themes are thriving and resilience. And um, I, I can think of many negative futures that do not include thriving or resilience. And I cannot think of any positive futures that are not thriving and resilient. So on the side of uh, thriving, I think, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, um, that we could talk about here about community wellness amplifying individual potential, um, our, our relationship to nature, um, and uh, overcoming uh, sort of outdated paradigms that are causing us to reach uh, suboptimal equilibriums, um, you know, preserving uh, uh, culture for future generations, and um, uh, creating spaces for very diverse cultural expression. And then on the resilience side, actually every time someone says decentralization to me now, I just replace it with the word resilience because that's the real deep why of why are we building decentralized systems is for these for resilience. And um, so uh, I, I think you know I, I would encourage you to if you haven't already to check out some of um, some of Vitalik's writings on uh, his techno uh, positivism, um, and there's a lot of projects in this area. But I'm going to continue. So what, what we're thinking about at, at Upside is how, how we can I think in a, in a framework about discovering uh, positive futures and uh, evaluating whether or not they're positive. So we have this framework which is about purposeful, viable results. And by purpose, I mean uh, finding a thriving and resilient future. By viable, these are the things that we mostly have been talking about. Most of the conversation today has been about viability and, and results. And um, we, we haven't dug in quite as much into the purpose question. But um, so for viability, this is like, does this team have the right capacity? Or is this, uh, you know, is this, what is the viability of this particular piece of land for, for tokenization? Um, there's also execution, plan, uh, budget, and um, how the team is is fit to the to the task, and then for results, uh, it's, is it within the return profile we're looking for? Also, um, it it could be some other kinds of results. For example, um, it, it can be something similar to ESG goals um, or a, a particular social outcome. The reason why I'm not saying ESG right now is because I think there are things within um, an, ex an accelerationist worldview or within the, the view that things are speeding up that haven't yet been captured quite perfectly in the ESG language. And so this framework, I would say, is like partially overlapping with, with those sets of goals. But uh, purposeful, viable results, if you have three, all three of them, then you have then what we would call ethos alignment. So, the other thing I want to mention is the, the new possibility for uh, this combination of blockchain, AI, and collective IQ. So we've talked about blockchain. We've talked about how um, Ethereum enables uh, better community coordination. I would call that collective IQ. And then now we're seeing is more of this integration with, uh, with AI components. And I, I think this is a really critical juncture because some of the things that we're defending ourselves from will come from AI and um, the, the blockchain infrastructure that we have either is or needs to become uh, resilient to that. Um, but this, the AI also can help us in, in another direction, which is about finding our path to these more positive futures 
and evaluating which projects actually are leading to them. So we, we are given this very strong modeling agent to try to help us work out of, out of this uh, sort of many, many seemingly intractable problems we have right now. The other part uh, is that AI can help us to democratize risk management. And um, you know, right, right now, individuals, uh, and this is very, uh, very much a problem in the, in the blockchain space, do not have enough information or don't have the skills to interpret whether or not a, a particular asset is going to be risky. And um, a, AI is extremely helpful in that direction, especially if tuned properly, and we'll, that will continue to develop. And then um, the last part is uh, that these things together can help us to preserve values-driven investment um, and uh, and this this can lead, help us lead our path to the positive future, uh, which is the goal. So uh, upside is uh, building in this in this area. Uh, we are uh, building a decentralized protocol uh, for coordinating values aligned investment with digital assets, and uh, we're leveraging AI and collective intelligence um, on the uh, on the investor side of the equation. And um, we uh, also are expa expanding our proven token operating system to further enable blockchain native investment and trading of digital assets with uh, increased global liquidity. Uh, that's almost an assumption in this conference, but I'll say that we're doing that as well. Um, and very importantly, we're convening community dialogue about finding positive futures. And um, I, I, this is, this is uh, very near and dear to my, my heart. And it includes both my uh, sort of technical interests and also my, my interests as being a human. I, I think we. We need to find ways to integrate that. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's it. I hope you will join the Renaissance and help us build this movement together. Um, uh, we, we're hosting a series of, uh, of dinners, uh, various events uh, to help with these dialogues. We're doing one uh, next week in Seoul, uh, next Friday. Um, and uh, there's a, a link there. Uh, I'm sorry, it's not a QR code. Um, there's limited room on this um, this particular one, but I uh, hope to see some of you there. And um, also, we'll be, be hosting many more of them. So please reach out to us if this kind of dialogue is interesting to you. Um, I'd be really excited to talk to you about it. Um, and there's some other social details here as well. And I want you to remember after this talk that um, together we collectively can uh, help decrypt the path to a thriving, resilient future. And I also just put it out there that uh, to invest in what you love. Thank you very much. <laughs>